And here's the reality. If we're going to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, if we're going to love others the way that we love ourselves, then you know what? We are going to long for people to believe, belong, and become. All right? So you all see these t-shirts that we got on this morning, right? All right? So I, I want to just kind of drill this into our church on a regular basis so that way we know. We want people to believe in Jesus and his what? His transforming power, okay? So I'm going to say we want people to believe in Jesus, and then I'm going to say, and what? And you're going to say, and his transforming power. Y'all got that? Everybody good? All right. We want people to believe in Jesus and his We want people to belong to, I didn't, yeah, his church. <laughs> I didn't get that far ahead, but these are things that I've been saying over and over again. So I was like, you know what? I got to make sure our church knows what each one of these words represents, all right? So we want people to belong to his church, all right? So we want people to belong to, are you glad to belong to his church? Man, we were part of something big and a part of something special. And then we want people to become everything he created them to be, all right? Everything he created them to be. So we want people to become everything. All right, so that's it. So every time you see believe, belong, become, it reminds us of our mission. It reminds us why we are here. And as believers who love God and love others, we must desire for people to believe in Jesus and his transforming power, belong to his church and become everything that God created them to be. If I'm being honest this morning, when I think about a vision Sunday, I feel the same way that I did probably six years ago. And if you could sum it up in one word, that one word would be overwhelmed. All right. So in one sense, it's just, I stand in awe of the way that God is saving people, the way that God is transforming people. I mean, those baptisms that we just saw there a minute ago, each one of those represents families and stories. And I was thinking about Carson. He was the last one that came out. Two baptisms ago, his mom got baptized. Last baptism, his dad got baptized. And this baptism, he got baptized. Will you praise the Lord for what God's doing in people's lives? I just, I get excited about that. I stand in awe of how people are believing, how people are belonging, what people are becoming, how you're growing in your faith and in your walk with the Lord. But at the same time, when I think about the future and I think about where God's leading us, I feel a bit overwhelmed because it feels very impossible. And it feels like where we were at six years ago. Six years ago, we were in the same type of predicament. We were running out of room in our auditorium. It was packed just like it is this morning. I mean, we were over 80% capacity, like I think 90% of the services, somewhere around there. I mean, it was just filling up and it was just, we ran into this dilemma. What are we going to do? Then on top of that, we weren't able to just take steps forward and just build a new auditorium because we had a million and a half dollar infrastructure project. We had parking lots and drainage problems that we had to solve before we could even think about new buildings. And all of it just felt very overwhelming. And it was just, what in the world are we going to do? And here's a quote. I was reminded of it this morning. of One of my favorite quotes. If you want to see the super, you have to do the natural. If you want to see the super, you have to do the natural. Well, our church six years ago responded in an incredible way. We started the Highway 2021 campaign. How many of you remember Highway 2021? Who was here for that? All right, we started the Highway 2021 campaign. Y'all gave $550,000 towards that. And then also we added a second service. We completely changed the entire schedule and the way that we did things. And I still get amazed by a church that lives on mission that was willing to just honestly turn some things upside down so that we could continue to make room for more people. We could continue to see God moving and working. And we added a second service. And if you want to see the super, you have to do the natural. And guess what? We did the things that we knew we were supposed to do. And God showed up and gave us a front row seat at only seeing what he could possibly do. And not only did we complete the parking lot and the drainage and the, the drainage project, which by the way, our parking lots, who still drives on this campus and is like, that is awesome. I get like that every time, man. And, and I, all of our landscaping has just like really gotten good this summer too. So it's just, I drive by and I stand in awe of God when I look at that. But not only were we able to do that, we were able to double the size of our property. We were able to add a new classroom facility, six new modulars. Our school has doubled in size. Our church has doubled in size. And the best part is we are seeing more people saved and baptized, seeing more people belong to his church, seeing more people becoming everything that God created them to be than we've ever seen before. Will you praise the Lord again this morning? 
And so here we are. We're running out of room. And I got to tell you, I'm excited about a third service. Who's excited about three services? Every time I tell somebody that, they're always like, they just look right back at me and they're like, how are you going to do that? And I say, you know, what's, ener what's energizing is just, again, seeing God moving and working in people's hearts and lives. So just to be clear, the third service will probably come in January as well. We still have, I don't want people thinking like next week we have a third service, okay? It's still, it's coming at some point during this year in January is the plan. We still have a lot of meetings and, and uh, planning to do with all the different details that are going to be involved in that. And then in January, we're also going to start the Behold 2028 Capital Campaign, and uh I'm getting really excited about a new auditorium. We have the property and we have the space for it. And do you, under, do you realize our church has not had a real auditorium in over 40 years? This is not, was never intended to be a real auditorium. This was originally built as a gymnasium. That's why there's like no foyer. It doesn't feel like a normal church when you come in here. And God's blessed. And man, we've had some incredible years in here. But it's exciting thinking about having a real auditorium and being able to move forward with that. But I'll tell you, that's overwhelming too because... I think we're going to be able to make it make sense that we can come up with like somewhere between five to eight million dollars, but it's probably going to cost 12 to 15 million dollars. And all I got to say is we got a lot of praying and trusting and faith in God. But I believe with all my heart, he's going to give us a front row seat to seeing what only he can do. But what I'm really excited about is pursuing the people in this community, seeing 100 people baptized. We didn't make it to 100 last year. You might be wondering, why do we have the same goal? again? We're going to keep going until we hit that goal. We didn't see it last year, but we did see 67 people. That's more than an average of one per week. Will you praise the Lord for that this morning? And I'm really excited about the money that we get to give towards missions, too. And uh, next week, we're going to introduce to you the Philippines Heritage Project. That's all I'm going to say. But it was really cool to be a part of building that dormitory over in India. And we have another project coming up in the Philippines. And I love the fact that not only can we reach Milton and Pace, but God allows us to be a part of what he's doing all around the world for his honor and for his glory. And so I truly am excited about this upcoming year and uh, just, again, seeing God and, and seeing God move and work and being able to give him all the honor and glory and praise. And that leads me to the title of our message this morning. If you have your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 16, and we are going to finish the book of Romans this morning. And uh, I'm excited. I think we did a really good job one year exactly in the book of Romans. And how do you end an awesome book like this? You end it exactly the way that Paul ends it. He ends it with a, dox, a doxology. Now, how many of you, when you hear that word doxology, you automatically think of, praise God from whom all blessing. Sometimes that just, when I hear doxology, that just pops into my mind right there. And you know what a doxology is? A doxology is words that ascribe praise and glory to God for what he's done. And you know how Paul is going to end this book? Paul is going to end this book the way that we should live our lives, the way that we should get up and start every single day, the way that you deal with incredible truth. He uses his final words to draw attention to the glory of God for what he's done. And we could not have a better passage for a vision, vision Sunday than this one. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read verses 21 through 24, and then you all are going to help me read verses 25 through 27, okay? So can everybody do that this morning? So Romans 16, I'll read 21 through 24, and then we'll all read the doxology together in 25 through 27. So the Bible says in Romans 16, verse 21, Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you, and Cordus, a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, everybody help me out, 25, 26, and 27. Here we go. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Now there is a lot of truth here and we're going to get right down to it. I was I was uh, reading some messages from a man that took seven and a half years to go through the book of Romans and he spent 
six messages on this last passage that I'm going to preach here this morning because every single one of those phrases that we just looked at is packed with meaning. To God be the glory. So let's just jump right in. The first thing that I want us to see this morning is that we belong. We belong. The verses that I read to you in verses 21 through 24, Paul mentioned eight more names. Now, he just finished his final appeal to the Romans where he was warning them about watching out for the false teachers and watching out for division that could come in there. And now he picks right back up where he left off with all of his final greetings. If you know, if you were here a couple weeks ago, in verses 1 through 16, Paul mentioned 27 people by name. And then here in those three, four verses that I read, he mentions eight more people. 27 plus 8 equals... Only a few of you had that. School is back in session this morning. 27 plus 8 equals 35. That's exactly right. 35 names of people, real life people here. And I just want to point out that churches are made up of people who belong to something special. When you go through names like this, each one of these people have a story. They have something that's interesting about them. They're made up of people who belong to something special. Now, some highlights from these verses. Look at verse 21. He says, Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. Now, we don't know much about Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, besides the fact that they were more than likely fellow Jewish countrymen of Paul's, and they were also worked closely with Paul. Outside of that, everything is speculation, and people speculate, but we're just going to leave it at they were people that were special to Paul. But Timothy, we know a lot about Timothy. For instance, for the past eight years, Timothy had served with Paul and as his companion, and he had traveled and he had ministered together with Paul. Paul was mentoring Timothy to take over his ministry for him one day. Paul says in Philippians that he served with him as a son with a father. Now, this is a very extremely close relationship. And he also says in that same passage that he had nobody else like Timothy who would care for them the same way that he would care for them. And so Timothy is his kindred spirit. And I want you to understand right now, nothing will bring you closer to people than serving with people. When you have a common goal, and when you belong to something that is bigger and greater than yourselves, nothing is going to bring you closer to people than serving together with people like that. And that's what happened here with Paul and Timothy. You want to know something else that's really cool about Timothy? Timothy was raised by his grandmother and his mother. I just think that this is such an important thing to point out this morning. We don't know much about his father besides that he was a Greek and he was most likely a non-believer. But the Bible gives credit to his grandmother and his mom for passing on their faith and raising him up into the Lord where he becomes a servant of God like he is. And all I can say to you is it doesn't matter what your circumstances are if they are less than the best. God is able to work in you and through you in incredible ways. And I just love pointing out how the gospel works. So that's Timothy. Then in verse 22, it says this, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. So you have Tertius here in verse 22. You have a man by the name of Cordus in verse 23. And many people believe that these both were former slaves. I was reading and doing some study, and I came across the fact that Tertius and Cordus are both, um, not, they're both Latin names that mean third and fourth. And it was common not to call slaves by their name, but to call them by number, like your third, your fourth. And that's, that's kind of how they treated them and how they looked at them. And here Tertius is, and, and I can't say that for sure if he was a, a former slave, but we know that many of these names were slave names, and people came from, obviously, some horrendous backgrounds and situations. But what we do know for sure about Tertius was that he was Paul's, you ready for a big word? Amanuensis. I don't know why. I just decided to throw that out there because every single message and every single thing I read, they wanted to throw that big word in there that he was Paul's amanuensis, which just basically means he was his secretary. Now, whether it was because Paul was not physically able to write the book of Romans or whether it was just common practice to have a secretary, which a lot of people said it was just a common practice of the day, Tertius only wrote the epistle in the sense that he wrote down what Paul told him to write down, all right? So he was his secretary, and he wrote down what Paul told him to write down. So why is Paul the one that's passing on all of these greetings? And then all of a sudden, Tertius just puts himself in this story. He says, I, Tertius, 
who wrote this epistle greet you? Is it because Paul said, hey, go ahead and pass along your greeting? I mean, you've been a big part of this. Or was Tertius just sitting there and he's like, Paul sending on all these other greetings, and did he get overwhelmed by what he was writing about the gospel and the amazing doctrine and truth in this book that he just gets overwhelmed and he's like, I want to put my own greeting in here. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Tertius makes it into the Bible and he makes it there because he was wholeheartedly serving the Lord and he was fulfilling a huge responsibility and he got to be a part of something great. And then you get to verse 20. Three. Everybody look at that with me. He says, Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. And then Cordus, a brother. So you have Gaius. Many people believe that Gaius is one of the two people that Paul baptized in the church at Corinth. And he mentions him in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But what we know about Gaius is he must have been a wealthy man because Paul stayed with him. And he hosted the whole church in his house. So he's a man of means. And he takes what he uses and, he, and takes what he has and uses it for the Lord. And then you also have a man by the name of Erastus who was the city chamberlain. He was a local government official. And I've not been to the city of Corinth, but I'm told that if you go to the city of Corinth today and you go to the ancient ruins, you will find a marble stone that has this man, Erastus, mentioned in it that dates back to the time of Paul. And here you have a city official that somehow gets saved and his life gets turned upside down. And he is a part of the story of what God did in Corinth and what God's doing through the church and what God's doing throughout all of the ages. So you have eight different names, eight people with unique stories, unique backgrounds, unique testimonies. You have former slaves. You have wealthy people. You have government officials. You have mothers. You have grandmothers. You have people who, who realize that they belong to something that was greater and bigger than themselves, and they decided to wholeheartedly serve God. And as a result of that, they get put in the story that God is writing and telling about his church and the lives that are being changed and the world that is coming to know Jesus Christ as their savior. And here's the practical application. Include yourself by serving. Include yourself by serving. You know what the beauty of the gospel story is? It's still being written. The gospel story is still being written. I love the way that Paul ends the, I mean, not Paul, Luke ends the book of Acts. It's kind of just like a to be continued. Because it's been to be continued for the past 2,000 years. And God is still writing the story here in Milton, Florida, at West Florida Baptist Church and at other churches that are lifting high the name of Jesus. The gospel story is still being written. And look at verse 24. I love it. Paul says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's not just to the church at Rome. That's also to us. By the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the grace of God be with you all through Jesus Christ. Amen. May the goodness and the fullness and the unmerited favor of God be with each and every single one of you as we live on mission, as we point people to a, a Savior in Jesus Christ and the hope that can only be found in him. May the goodness and the grace and the fullness and the kindness and the mercy and love of God go with us as we present Jesus to a world that is in desperate need of him. Can I tell you the gospel story is still being written. And you and I can be included in his story by serving. Just this past week, I, I had some really great conversations. I, I met with a couple um, at a coffee shop earlier this week, and they come from a, they're a blended family. And you know what their burden is? Their burden is to start a ministry that ministers to blended families and the unique needs that come along with that. I'm sitting there and I'm like just listening to their testimony and a lot of the brokenness and the things that come with it. But by God's grace, he really does take beauty. And he makes beauty from ashes and he transforms things for his honor and for his glory. Take that story and serve people. That, that's how we get included in God's story. Man, yesterday I was at a gym. I was at the CrossFit open house. And uh, God's doing a work in Joey and Sandy back there. And there's a lot of people from that gym that are coming. And I think he just wanted to invite me to torture me. I couldn't even wash my back this morning, guys. My arms are so sore from that workout they put me through yesterday. 
But what I love about whenever I get a chance to talk to Joey, even yesterday, we're sitting there, we're talking. And he's like, he wants to use the gym and fitness and things that God's given him that he's passionate about. And how can we get people involved in this? How can we fellowship? How can we make this into a minister? I love that. I think that's fantastic. That's how God takes us and uses us for a story. Hey, Jen Riley's sitting back there this morning. One of my announcements I have today is about grief share that's coming up. Grief Share has been an incredible class that we've had here. A lot of people from the community that have come that have lost loved ones and are going through just suffering and trying to put their lives back together. And Jen's going to step up and teach it this year. And Jen, has, Jen and Jared have a, an incredible story of loss. Their best friend, their family, died in a house fire. I think them and several of their children, I think all but one, one child was two children. All but two children were lost in that house fire. And Jen just had to go through that, just losing your best friends and the horrificness of that. But here she is years later, and she's going to allow God to work through what she's learned and how God's brought healing into her life and be able to minister to other people. That's how we get included in God's story. You belong to something bigger and greater than yourself. Serve. Take your talents, your abilities, your brokennesses, your messes. Surrender it all to God and watch him step in and clean it up and watch him use you in incredible ways for his honor and for his glory. So we belong. Not only do we belong, we become. Look at verse 25. Here Paul begins his, the doxology. In verse 25 he says, Now to him that is of power... To establish you according to my gospel. Let's all read that first line. Help me out, okay? This is a really big line. You underline this, circle it, highlight it. Help me read it again. Here we go. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Of all of the things that Paul could have said about the power and majesty and might of our God and our Savior, you know what he says? That God has the power to establish you, that God has the power to strengthen you. Now, stay with me for a minute. He strengthens us, look at back in that verse, in verse 25, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. So we're strengthened through the gospel, we're strengthened through the preaching of Jesus Christ, and then he says, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets. What Paul is saying here, why he's, why he's overwhelmed, why he can't do anything but praise, is he's, it's all clicking and it's making sense. For 4,000 years, the way that God was moving and working in this world, it was a mystery. Even in the Old Testament, they had glimpses of God and they knew a little bit about him and they knew about a Messiah, but they didn't know how it was all going to work and how it was all going to culminate. In Ephesians, it says, even the angels, the principalities and powers, they're watching what God's doing in Israel. They're watching the um, Old Testament sacrifices and the tabernacle and the worship. And they're sitting up there and they're just like, what is God doing? I wonder what he's doing. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, the creator of heaven and earth, God himself leaves heaven. He's born in a virgin. He lives on this world for 30 years. I mean, even the angels are like, what is happening? What is going on and taking place? He dies on a cross. He's buried. And on the third day, he rises again from the grave. And all of a sudden, these disciples and apostles who were just these Honestly, these weak and pathetic human beings, just like you and me, okay, they really were. They were a mess. All of a sudden, they get this strength inside of them, and they, they get this passion, and they go out, and they start preaching the gospel, and now people are getting saved, Jews and Gentiles, and it's all coming together and culminating in this one unbelievable body of Christ. The church of God is born. His truth is going out. The world's being turned upside down for God, and all of a sudden, it all makes sense. That's what you've been doing. That was the purpose for the nation of Israel. That's how you're blessing all the world, through your son, Jesus Christ. That's what the sacrifice is pointed to, the ultimate sacrifice that's going to come one day. And you know what? He did all of that, not just so that you and I could be saved, but so that you and I could be strengthened. Here's the practical application. Strengthen yourself by faith. We become, when we grow and we become strong in our faith, strengthen yourself by faith. You know what's awesome about God? 
God feels no threat by our strength whatsoever. Have you ever realized that the most powerful leaders and dictators and tyrants throughout history, you know how they've gotten their power? By keeping their citizens weak, poor, and uneducated. You know that strong people are a threat to their power. Strong people are a threat to their glory. And so as a result, they maintain their power by standing on the backs of weak and broken people. But can I tell you this morning, that is not how our God operates. You know how our God operates? He looks for the weak. And he looks for the broken. And he says, you know what? I'm going to take you and I'm going to fix you up. And I'm going to make you strong. And the stronger you get, the more glory I get. So I'm going to pour my strength on you. I'm going to pour my power. I'm going to use you in incredible ways. Because I get great glory through you. That's how our God moves. And that's how he operates. He looks for broken and weak people. I could spend all day telling you Bible stories and examples. How about David? Where did he find David? He found him as a shepherd. The youngest kid in his family, not even worthy enough to be brought before Samuel when they're looking for the next king. And you know what he does? He goes out and he kills a giant, the greatest underdog story of all time. Man, I think about Mary. Mary was poor. She was forgotten. She was a teenage girl, but she wasn't forgotten by God. And you know what? An angel of the Lord comes and says, hey, Mary, I got a really big task for you. What is it? You are going to give birth to the Son of God. Could you imagine that broken, poor girl that's been forgotten about no longer? Man, I love Matthew. How many of you have watched The Chosen? Anybody seen The Chosen? I love how they portray Matthew in The Chosen. They just portray him as this quirky, strange kind of guy. He's just like quirky and he's strange and he's hated because he's a tax collector. And then all of a sudden... God uses his life, and he pens the very first gospel in the New Testament. He gets included in God's story. I could go on and on. I could list name after name. I could tell you about a guy by the name of Mike Brown. He's weak and got some issues. And God said, you know what? I want you to be a preacher. And I said, no way. I don't want to speak in front of people. I'm terrified of you all. No, just kidding. I'm not anymore. But I was ter- the thought of public speaking was horrendous to me. And my first two attempts at it, I'm not just talking about like, crash and burn. It was like crash and like explosion, like nuclear bomb burn, okay? I mean, the first time I got up in front of people, I was, I got, I was emotional. I started crying and got a little choked up. And then the next thing I tried to do, I was like 18. So I was like, you can't be crying in front of people. So I started to laugh. And I kid you not, this is not even exaggerated. This is not ministerially speaking. I did this in front of the entire church. I said, (laughs) and then I heard it and I laughed even harder. And I went, twice. And my best friend Dave was sitting there and he just put his head down and laughed for the next 30 minutes. And I was like, how do you recover from that? I said, I'm done, God. I'm not doing this anymore. And he said, no, get back up there. And I got back up there and failed again. But here we are. (laughs) And it's still probably up and down sometimes. But the point is this, God wants to use us and he wants to strengthen you and he wants to establish you. Man, I'm thinking about the fact that the stronger we are in faith and hope and love through the gospel, the greater and more glorious that he appears. This is why we add another service. This is why we we dream big about a new auditorium that, that feels impossible, the amount of money that it costs. But you know what? We serve a God who owns everything and money is not an obstacle with him. This is why we do those things. This is why we strive to give a million and a half dollars towards missions and to not just getting focused on here, but still remembering that we're a part of something that's greater and bigger than us. And if we honor what God honors, God will bless. This is why we strive and pray for people to be saved. This is why you take your talents and abilities and you get off the sidelines and you decide to serve God because God wants to strengthen us. You know what? We're not capable of the vision that God has laid out for us. It's bigger and greater than us. I don't have all the answers. We are not capable of it, but all I know is that I'm supposed to do what God tells me to do, and I'm supposed to follow him by faith, and if we do our part, God will give us a front row seat to seeing him do what only he can do, and you can either be a part of it or you don't have to be a part of it, but you can either stay weak or you can sit back and get amazed at how God comes in and how he strengthens you by pouring out the Holy Spirit and his power in your heart and in your life. And so let's become, let's just believe that God wants to take us. We are, how many of you are weak? I feel really weak this morning after being at that gym. 
I felt really good too. I'll just, tell, I'll just give credit to where credit is due. We were having a little bit of a competition against Patty and Tiffany and Mary Catherine that were there. And Dave and I won in time and I felt really good. Yeah, of course we did. We won. Until Tiffany had to come and rub it in that they did it the, they did it the way that it was supposed to be done and we modified it and did less of weights. So now I feel really weak this morning. Got beat by the ladies. Anyway, where was I? <laughs> We're weak, aren't we? Not just physically, but we're just weak in our faith. We're broken. We got issues. We fall short of God's glory, but God is looking exactly for that. People that say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know why you would want to use me, but here I am. Take me and use me in whatever way you see fit. Here I am. So we belong, we become, and last, we believe. Look at verse 26. But now is made manifest... And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of the faith. We already talked about how the gospel is clearly seen. The Old Testament makes perfect sense now. Everything just, it lines up. You see it all in Jesus and you understand what God has been doing. But then he drops this incredible line. According to the commandment of the everlasting God. Do you know behind Jesus Christ stands the everlasting God, the holy God who is holy, holy, holy. He is unlike us in every way. And you know what his commandment was? You know what his eternal purpose was? Before he ever created us, before he ever formed us, he knew that we would be broken. He knew that we would sin. He knew that we would be weak. He knew that we would fail him over and over again. But yet he designed a way for him to be just and the justifier. He said the punishment for sin is death. And I'm going to send my son, my only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And he's going to go and he's going to die. And the penalty for sin is going to be paid. And and when that happens and that takes place, then I will be able to be a justifier. I will be able to take all of those who believe in me by faith and declare them righteous because I'm not looking at them. I'm looking at my son, Jesus Christ. That was the eternal commandment of our eternal God. Behind Jesus stands God and everything's going according to his plan. And you know what else he says there? According to the commandment of the everlasting God. Made known to all nations for the obedience of the faith. Man, why do we have to live on mission? Why, do we, why is it always about people? And why is it always about witnessing? And why is it always about sharing our faith? And why is it always about our neighbors and our coworkers and our family members? Because that is the commandment that God has laid out for us. He wants his name and his gospel and his truth to be made known to all nations, to every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation. We have been given a mandate. How can we do anything but lift high the name of Jesus? How can we do anything but care about people? How can we do anything but witness and pray and share and go and and point people to the hope that can be found in him? It's given to us by the commandment of God. And so here's the last practical application, and we are done. Devote yourself to glory. Devote yourself to glory. Look at verse 27. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. I I can just see Paul just almost not even being able to write this. To God only, as he looks back on the entire book of Romans and and where he started in chapter one, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And here he's just wrapping up every theme that he just talked about. God doesn't want to just save me. He wants to strengthen me. To God only wise. And he strengthens me through the gospel and through the preaching of Jesus Christ. I like the fact that he even called it my gospel. It wasn't Paul's gospel. It was God's gospel. It was Jesus's gospel. But he personalized it. I've been thinking about that, man. It is my gospel. It's personal to me. It's my identity. My identity is not I'm a pastor and I'm a husband and I'm a father of three kids. My identity is I am a child of God. I am a believer in Jesus Christ. Man, according to the gospel, and he's just getting overwhelmed and the mystery. You remember when it, when it clicked with you and it's like everything just makes sense and you just stand in all that God loves you. And then, man, that we get to make this known to all generations and all people. 
Devote yourself to glory. A few weeks ago, I was teaching in the book of Psalms on Wednesday night. And I saw this phrase that God's people are the excellent ones in all the earth. And it was right in the middle of the Olympics. And I just remember thinking, that's a pretty big statement. I mean, God's people are the ones that inspire awe and reverence. And we're in the middle of the Olympics. And I think that's amazing because we live in a world that's filled with Olympic athletes. And man, there's some all inspiring things that human beings can do. Like for instance, Katie Ledecky, I loved Katie Ledecky and her story. I mean, she's not just a good swimmer. In the 1500 meters race, she destroys people. Like she has the top 21 fastest times in all of the world. And when she wins that race, it's like by a whole pool length. She's just dominant. And then you got like Simone Biles. I, I watched gymnastics. I'm not going to be ashamed to admit it. it was fun this year, but Simone Biles, I saw her on that little um, balance beam, four inches wide. And she's like got her leg down. I can't even like get down like how she was, okay? I can't even do that. She gets down like that and then spins herself around three full times. And I'm watching the other competitors come up. They're only doing it two and they're barely making it through two. And then she like on that floor mat was up 14 feet in the air, higher than even the guys were. I mean, it's just like incredible the things that you can do. My favorite guy out of all though was that shooter from like Turkey or whatever. That dad, that dad was cool, man. Like all these other young people were out there with all the gear. They got like thousands of dollars worth of gear and sights. And this dad just steps out with a t-shirt and jeans on, puts his hands in his pocket and wins the silver medal. I was like, that is excellent right there. That's what it's all about. And I, I could go on and on with stories. But you know what the Bible says? God's people are the excellent ones in all the earth. More glory than any Olympic athlete should ever receive, more glory than any king, more glory than any successful entrepreneur or businessman are God's people. We're the ones that inspire awe and reverence. And is it because there's anything great about us? No, it has absolutely nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with what we devote ourselves to. And we devote ourselves to making the wisdom of God and the glory of God known and seen. We devote ourselves to other people seeing the truth and the worth and the beauty and the greatness of God because he alone is worthy of it. We devote ourselves to lifting high the name of Jesus and going to people and saying, yes, you're a sinner. Yes, you're broken. We all are. I'm a sinner and I'm broken. But can I tell you, there's a God that loved you enough and he died on the cross so that you could be saved. And I don't know what you're facing today and I don't know what, what kind of problem feels impossible, but I know a God who can transform every single thing about your situation and everything about your life. I know a God who wants you to become everything that he created you to be. You're created in his image and his likeness. Do you understand the message that we have in the gospel? And all I can say to you this morning is, how can we not? How can we not add a third service? How can we not try to build a new auditorium? How can we not give more money to missions and to special missions projects and reaching people all around the world with the gospel? How can we not pray for 100 people to be baptized? How can I not personally start praying for who God lays on my heart, for a neighbor? I, don't, I hope I don't have to pray for my coworkers, but some of you do. <laughs> If you get that, it's because we all work here, okay? So, but how, who is it? Who's my coworker? Who's the person at the gym? Who is it that I need to be burdened about? Who is it that, that's, that needs the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ? How can I not devote myself to that? How can we as a church not continue to move forward and take all that God's doing in us and through us and use it for his honor and for his glory?